Talks presentation to the ANA's eLearning Academy. As you may have seen, we've recently added many new eLearning opportunities to our website. If you have not seen the, the money.org website in the last couple of months, I recommend watching the presentations we've added as well as checking out our upcoming schedule. Now, during this presentation, you may come up with questions. If you do, please use the chat or QA button at the bottom of your screen to send in your question as all of our attendees are muted during this presentation. Your question will come to me and I will share the questions with the presenters at the end. If at the end of the presentation, we are unable to get to all of the questions, I will send them to the presenters to answer. Toward the end of the presentation, I will be sending out a survey using the poll feature here in Zoom. Please answer each question honestly so that we can improve our presentations. The surveys will be shared anonymously with the presenters. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our presenters for the day, Charles Heck and Wayne Homerin. They will be giving a money talk titled, George Clapp, Charles Clapp, and Robert Book, Pittsburgh's Numismatic Copper Trio. Now, the personal and numismatic lives of these three men is one of the most interesting stories that can be told. Unfortunately, much incorrect information has been published. This presentation will set the record straight by providing evidence from the archives of the ANS, the Carnegie Museum, and the archives of the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society. Now a little bit about our presenters. Chuck Heck has been collecting coins, paper money, and numismatic literature for 65 years, focusing on ancient Greek and Roman coins and U.S. large cents, bust half dollars, hard times tokens, and colonial issues. His current area of interest is medals of the New York Numismatic Club and the Rochester Numismatic Association. He is the secretary of his local Sun City Coin Club in Bluffton, South Carolina, and treasurer of the Numismatic Bibliomania Society, or NBS. He also is a longtime member of the ANA, the ANS, or American Numismatic Society, C4, or Colonial Coin Collectors Club, and uh, EAC, or Early American Copper Society, FUN, Florida United Numismatists, or, and the John Wright uh, Collector Society, Metal Collectors of America, New York Numismatic Club, and life member of Palm Beach Coin Club. As a retired CPA, he frequently lectures on the tax and estate issues for collectors and numismatic not-for-profit entities. Wayne Homerin is a life member of the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society. His specialties include the U.S. Civil War, tokens and medals, panic script, money art, and numismatic literature. He edits the, numis he edits the weekly hobby newsletter, the e Siloam, and is a consultant for the new Newman Numismatic uh, Portal, or the NNP. He is a member of multiple organizations, including the ANA, the ANS, Rittenhouse Society, the NBS, and PAN, or the Pennsylvania Association of Numismatists. Gentlemen, when you are ready, the floor is yours. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Sam. This is uh, Wayne Homerin, and I'm going to kick it off with uh, an overview of uh, the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society and uh, some of the early founders of the group. Uh, then we'll uh, hand it off to Chuck, who will dive uh, a lot more into the uh, collections of a couple of these, of these men. So before diving into all this, um, I'm going to start a little bit closer to uh, today's time frame. Uh, a, some of you on board today will probably recall the, uh, the 1960s. Uh, others will be too young to remember this, but 1964 was the last year that silver was used in our coinage. So the dimes, the quarters, the half dollars no longer had silver. Uh, they were replaced with the uh, clad format that we, that we use today. And what happens when a change like that occurs? Well, what happens is people start to notice their coinage. For years, they may have you know, used them at the store to pay the paper boy, the milkman, whatever, and never really taken a close look at their 
their coinage. Well, in the 1960s, people started to look. And as a result, many, many people were converted to collecting uh, coins. In the 1960s were a, a huge year for, for numismatics in uh, the United States. So now let's take it back in time to something that happened in 1857. Just like in the 1960s when the silver disappeared, 1857 was the last year of the large cents. And as the new smaller coins start coming out, people began to notice. People who never paid much attention to their coins before uh, now started looking. And as the uh, older coins started disappearing, you know, more and more people began saving them, collecting them, taking a look at them, you know, understanding that, oh, these have different designs. Oh, these have different dates. And if you put enough of them together, you might even start to realize, oh, even this certain date has different styles, or as we call them today, varieties. Uh, so it just all of a sudden became the in thing to do. Lots of people suddenly began collecting coins. So in 1858, you had the founding of the Numismatic and Antiquarian Society of Philadelphia, uh, one of the first coin clubs in the country. Uh, 1860, you had the Boston Numismatic Society, which is still going, going strong today. And uh, a number of other groups scattered around uh, the East Coast uh, were, were formed uh, in those, those early years. So now we're gonna switch to Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh specifically, and in the year, uh, 1878, these eight men listed on the screen here got together and formed the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society. Now, as, as we'll see in a minute, uh, a number of these people had been collecting coins for quite some time since they were, since they were children, in fact, but uh, there had never been an organized club in uh, the Pittsburgh area. So following the lead of Philadelphia, Boston, uh, New York, um, the ANS, of course, the American Numismatic Society was founded in 1858. So now uh, in Western Pennsylvania, a number of guys decided to get together and they started this club. Now at the outset, we mentioned the archives of the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society. So to answer the, the question, you know, how do we know that it was founded on a certain date and, and that it was founded by these certain gentlemen? Well, you're looking at the answer on the right side of your screen. Uh, this is from the archives of the WPNS. These original meeting minutes books, the original treasurer's account books and other um, records of the society still exist today. And uh, it, it's amazing after all this time, but uh, you know, the collectors managed to, to salvage this material and it still exists today. And back in around uh, 1978, 80, I was the uh, uh, curator of the club and had in my possession these, these records. So I took advantage of this and uh, wrote a history of the society. And uh, it's far too much to go into here, so we'll skip over all the detail, but I would refer you to the website of the WPNS. Uh, it's uh, WPNS1878.org. And on that site uh, is a link for the history. And uh, the only thing I would uh, suggest is don't forget to check the, the links at the bottom of each page because that will take you to the next page. There's actually about four or five different web pages that have the, uh, the complete history of the club. So let's go back to these gentlemen. Um, first one on the list here, George H. Clapp, and we're gonna learn a lot more about him in today's presentation uh, from, from Chuck. Uh, George Rode, R.W. Shipman, John Rivett, Frank Kirk, S.H. Morgan, E.F. Maynard, and Henry McKnight. Now, when I started my history, the only name I had heard of was uh, George Clapp. And uh, he's certainly still very famous today, uh, one of the reasons that we're all here listening to this talk. But uh, it turns out there's some fascinating stories behind some of these other gentlemen. And I'm gonna give a quick uh, overview here. So, uh, I'm not going to read through all this. You can certainly take a look at this uh, uh, later. We're going to going across the top, up at the upper left. We've got S. H. Morgan, 
He was the first president of uh, WPNS, and uh, he was actually a very prolific dealer and had multiple uh, coin sales between 1879 and 1881. This is something that uh, even most uh, numismatic bibliophiles are probably not very aware of. You know, everybody knows the famous coin dealers of Philadelphia and New York, the Frossards, the Kogans, um, but uh, there were uh, a number of coin auctions in the 1870s and early 1880s in Pittsburgh. And uh, the biggest cataloger of those was S.H. Morgan, uh, the president of, of WPNS. Um, his own personal collection was later auctioned in uh, 1882. Now, the next gentleman is, uh, is my favorite among the group. Uh, gotta love Clapp, but uh, George Rode was the WPNS secretary. And he was the real workhorse of not just WPNS, but uh, the American Numismatic Association as well. He was ANA charter member number 12. He served as what was called the uh, ANA Secretary of Exchange. And this was basically kind of a mail order uh, feature of the club where you could basically trade trade coins through the mail with other members of the ANA. I mean, it's nothing that's done today, but uh, he, uh, you know, Mr. Rhodes served in that, uh, in that role in the very early days of the ANA. Not only that, he helped organize the first ANA convention in 1892, which was held in Pittsburgh, together with the man below him, uh, Mr. Henry McKnight. Um, so that's, again, yet a whole other uh, talk for another, for another time. Frank Kirk uh, had quite a collection of United States coins, as did all of these gentlemen. Uh, we move down to the bottom uh, left, we've got R.W. Shipman. He also was a coin cataloger. He just had one sale, but he cataloged a sale in January of 1890s, excuse me, 1879. He was also a charter member of the ANA, number uh, 79, and uh, his business uh, was operating a hotel. Uh, we mentioned Henry McKnight, uh, another ANA charter member, uh, organized the convention. Then along with uh, Maynard was another hotel operator, um, coincidentally enough, and uh, a man named John Rivett, who uh, worked with his family that had a, a business uh, selling uh, newspapers. That uh, note at the bottom right there is uh, actually something that's in a way a, a defining uh, characteristic of, of this club, the WPNS. They were a fairly exclusive group. They had high standards. They really wanted to make sure that the people in their group knew their stuff and uh, you know, were the right sort of people that you would want to have in, uh, in a club uh, of gentlemen. And it was all men. Uh, it was you know, nearly a century before a, a woman became involved and as, as an officer or member of the organization. Uh, yet another story to be, uh, to be told at some other time. But uh, as it notes there, John Rivett was actually the first WPNS member to be expelled from membership under the, uh, the rules of the Constitution. Um, there's uh, another rule in the Constitution where three black balls will exclude uh, one from membership. So taking a vote of the existing members, if uh, three of them vote you down, you do not get into the club. So it was never a, uh, a, an option to just basically show up and pay your dues, like in most societies or clubs. Um, you know, they were really pretty exclusive. And uh, in a way, it became their downfall because by 1889, they had uh, basically turned away or expelled so many people that there was not too many people left. And they uh, disbanded the organization for a number of years. So that's uh, kind of the downfall of having high standards is uh, you know, sometimes uh, the only ones left are, uh, are you know, a, a couple of you. But you know, it, the club certainly thrived for quite a number of years and uh, uh, it was reorganized in about 20 years after that dissolution in 1909. Uh, they became a charter member uh, number six of the ANA and have been meeting regularly every month uh, since that reorganization and uh, they still meet today. So let's uh, learn a little bit more. 
You can see here from uh, this slide, these are the front covers of a couple of the coin sales that were held in Pittsburgh. Uh, as mentioned, uh, there were 13 of them by uh, S.H. Morgan. Uh, there were uh, one by Shipman, one by a man named Jonas Adler. Uh, very interesting catalogs to collect. Uh, relatively cheap when you find them, um, but uh, hard to piece together a complete, uh, a complete set. Uh, George Road, as you see there in the, in the middle, this uh, little piece of paper was an insert in a number of uh, catalogs. He would basically offer to serve as your proxy at the, uh, at the auction to make your bids for you. So if you were from out of town, say a New York or Philadelphia, Boston collector, you could write to George Road and tell him what uh, coins you were interested in and he would bid for you at the sale. Uh, up top there is uh, an illustration of uh, the first metal produced by the WPNS. Uh, as it says there, it was founded June 14th, 1878. Uh, there were medals uh, in 1878, 1879, uh, again on the 50th, uh, 75th, and 100th anniversary, 125th. So there's quite a uh, grouping of WPNS medals that are out there to collect. Uh, this early one was uh, uh, commissioned to George Lovett, uh, the famous die sinker. So it's a, it's a very nice metal, uh, available, available in copper, silver, and it looks like this one pictured here is in, uh, in white metal. So let's uh, look at some of the people again. Uh, those were the founders that we talked about just now, but, but some of the people who joined very shortly afterwards are some very important names in, in, in numismatics. Uh, the first one there at the left is uh, Charles Guise. I believe that's how you pronounce it, A.C. Guise. He collected Civil War tokens as a boy. Uh, now, I don't know if it was from circulation or not, but uh, uh, he was a longtime collector was one of the first members to join the club after it was formed. Uh, he joined in uh, January of 1879. Uh, also very active in the ANA. He was a trustee by, in uh, 1904. And uh, there's a letter in the archives from George Clapp, who uh, basically thanked Charles Guise for being the guy who held the club together for 60 years. Uh, he was like that one stalwart member you could always count on. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he was the one who uh, maintained possession of these, uh, these records all these years. Now his collecting specialty was US half dollars and uh, Stax offered a sale of his collection. I think it was a fixed price list in 1940. So very, very, um, uh, specialized as a collector, marvelous collection. And uh, he was, by 1940, the oldest living collector in the United States. Uh, there was an article in uh, one of the Pittsburgh papers, and I think also in some of the uh, uh, national publications, perhaps the numismatist. He was 99 years old. So he was uh, definitely the, the dean of American collectors at, uh, at that point. Now, Jonas Adler, in, in the middle here, he's an interesting guy. He cataloged a coin sale as well in April, 1878, but he developed a bad reputation with the dealers. If you look through some of the publications of folks like uh, Edward Frassard and uh, Mason, some of their publications, they would list some of the deadbeats or some of the people they had beefs with, and uh, Jonas Adler's name came up uh, a couple of times. Now, he was proposed as a member of uh, WPNS in February of 1879, and uh, as he was the first one to be blackballed, you know, not even let into membership in the first place. Uh, the other guy, Rivet, one of the founders, he was later expelled. Um, but, uh, you know, Jonas Adler didn't even get through the front door. So there was an article I came across in 1858, he ended up in jail for swindling a Pittsburgh coin dealer. Now the article I saw did not name this dealer, but uh, by the description uh, to me, I think it was actually George Road. That's, that's my guess at this point. So interesting uh, uh, ne'er-do-well from, the, uh, from the, the WPNS, an almost member, but certainly a, uh, a uh, famous or infamous uh, member of uh, Pittsburgh uh, coin societies. 
Uh, Charles Schinkel later became an author, offered, published a book, as you see here, U.S. Coins and Lists was very important. And then uh, another one of the folks to join uh, uh, in uh, May uh, of, of uh, I'm sorry, I can't see the year here on my screen, but uh, he, Robert D. Book, uh, he was a uh, teller uh, at a bank and uh, later became, uh, you know, quite uh, well known in uh, Pittsburgh uh, society, you know, went on for quite a number of years. So we're going to learn a little more learn uh, a lot more about uh, Robert Book in a bit from uh, Chuck's presentation. But before we get into that, I just wanted to talk lastly about uh, one particular member, and his name is George Hubbard Clapp. Born 18, excuse me, uh, December 14th, 1858, Allegheny City, Pennsylvania. That's actually part of uh, the city of Pittsburgh today. Uh, he uh, collected coins as a boy, and uh, the way he came across his coins was sifting through the collections of a uh, toll collector on a bridge between uh, the downtown Pittsburgh and Allegheny City. So I don't know if he was friends with the toll collector or relative or, or whatever, but uh, he would go there and look through the, uh, the coins that had been collected and uh, take out uh, some for his collections. He attended uh, what was called at the time Western University of Pennsylvania, uh, which is now University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we already know he became a founder of the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society. But uh, you know, beyond that, what's interesting about him beyond uh, numismatics uh, is his career. Uh, some of his uh, positions are listed there, but uh, the most uh, uh, telling or fortunate event uh, for Mr. Clapp was meeting a gentleman named Charles Martin Hall. Uh, and Charles Hall was an inventor who invented a process for reducing aluminum, which is basically a way of, you know, taking the rocks and getting the aluminum out into a pure form where it can actually be used. And if you, you turn back the clock to the 1870s, aluminum at that time was a very, very expensive metal, more expensive than gold. And you know, with the process that Dr. Hall developed, uh, it became possible to uh, refine aluminum on an industrial scale. And uh, to get to that scale, uh, Mr. Clapp reached out to another fellow Pittsburgher, a gentleman named Andrew Mellon uh, of the, uh, the Mellon banking family. And with funding from the Mellons and the invention of Charles Martin Hall, George Hubbard Clapp formed uh, what is today the Aluminum Corporation of America, or Alcoa. So he was with this corporation as an officer basically for the rest of his life. And you know, the stock and uh, equity that he had in that corporation you know, enabled him to, uh, to live quite well. And uh, as you'll see, buy you know, all the coins that he, uh, that he cared for for his collection. So uh, lucky him. And it was curious to me when I was doing this, uh, this, this research to learn about Clapp and, and some of these, these dates, because as we mentioned, he was born in 1858 and at the age of 20 became a founder of the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society in 1878. Well, here I come along. I was born in Pittsburgh in 1958 and at the age of 20 became uh, the youngest member at the time of the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Society. So both events were exactly 100 years later. So quite a coincidence. Um, so uh, that's why I've, I've always felt kind of a special kinship for uh, George Hubbard Clapp. And today's my birthday. So this, is, uh, this has been fun. And uh, one more slide here before I turn it over to, uh, to Chuck. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, a couple of more. Uh, just about George Clapp himself, uh, we already mentioned he collected uh, uh, cents. Here's one of his books uh, on, on the U.S. cents of 1798 to 1799. Here's uh, one of the uh, photographic plates uh, in the book. Here's a couple others that he wrote, uh, you know, basically filling out the different years. Uh, that last one is written together with uh, Howard Newcomb, but uh, three books all together. Uh, there's a later picture of him as a distinguished uh, gentleman of uh, society. Uh, so these books are valuable, uh, rare today. Uh, they only made so many of them in the first place, but um, uh, 
because of the photographic plates, the information within, they're still uh, widely uh, collected today. So lastly, the uh, CLAP Large Scent Collection. Chuck, of course, will tell you a lot more about this, but uh, he put together two frontline sets, and ultimately uh, one of his sets, his first line collection, was donated to the American Numismatic Society in New York. His second line collection was donated to the uh, Carnegie Museum of Natural History uh, and became one of the uh, founding parts of their, uh, their coin collection. Uh, the clap large scents are still there today, uh, amazingly. Uh, they had quite a brush with uh, deacquisition in the, uh, the, the 1970s. The uh, museum decided to sell off its coin collection, which was an amazing collection. It took four auctions on three continents to, uh, to liquidate that collection. But because of the uh, protests and actions of local collection collectors, uh, one of the things that was saved intact at the museum was George Clapp's large scent collection. And it is still there uh, today. And just uh, within the last year, has been photographed by the Newman Numismatic Portal. And uh, really nice high resolution photographs of the coins are available on uh, the Newman Portal to, to review today. So uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Chuck, who's gonna tell us a lot more about uh, WPNS members, Robert Book and Charles Clapp and their uh, collections. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much, that was outstanding. Let me just pull up my, okay. Well, I wanna welcome everybody. Thank you for attending. I think you just saw one of the most incredible presentations I've ever seen about some of the men that we know and the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Association. What I'm here to talk about <clears throat> are some of these men and what we don't know about them and change what we have been told about them. So let's get started. And by the way, thanks to uh, Sam and the ANA for uh, putting this on. It, it breaks our hearts that we couldn't be in Pittsburgh. But here we are now. Here are photographs of the, of the three men. Uh, George Clapp in his middle years, somewhat distinguished looking gentleman. There's his younger brother, Charles Clapp. Younger brother, not older brother. Charles was younger. Uh, Charles E. Clapp. And there's their friend, Robert D. Book. As you know, they all knew each other, both George and Charles being brothers, obviously, but Robert being a member of the Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Association, George being a founding member. Let's talk a little bit about Charles. He's the one that is probably, he probably has the most incorrect information out there about him. He was born two years after his older brother, George. He was born in the end of 1860, back there in November. Uh, both, uh, they had a, a sister, an older sister, Kate. And I'd like you to know that he was married to Cornelia Ella Hunter. You see here, I'm going to point to a few things. Well, the Hunter family... They were also quite well off and very popular in uh, Pittsburgh society. Cornelia's aunt was married to Henry Frick. Now, if you know anything about Henry Frick, I don't want to concentrate just on his wealth, but this is what I'm going to do. He's one of the richest men in the world. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. So Cornelia's aunt, was married to Henry Frick. Both Charles and his wife had three children, Harold, Kenneth, and I wanna highlight here in red, also Charles. I'm highlighting in red because we'll come back to that later. He worked in the steel industry, first with Park Steel and eventually becoming the fourth vice president of Crucible Steel. He did so well that he was, reti he was retired at, at, at the age of 45. Lived in Allegheny, which is now Pittsburgh, moved to Washington, D.C., and New York City, eventually. He did retire and lived out his life in Bedford Hills. I might mention that when I did a little research, the move to New York City, everybody knows he was retired. I, jokingly, I, I think he was a company spy. There were a lot of things that went on in New York City that 
I'm not too sure about, but he was involved with, I think he made deals, let's say, for uh, the steel company. Let's go on to a little bit about his coins. Charles is known by colonial collectors as a specialist in especially Massachusetts silver. We'll get into that in just a second. But up at the ANS, in the American Numismatic Society in New York City, there's an 11-page handwritten group of notes on his inventory, the first three pages of which included his mass silver. And this is the first page that I'm showing. And in the notes that the ANS puts out and publishes on this inventory of colonials is the fact that he sold his collection, Charles sold his collection to Brother George in 1924. Now that's shorthand because in actuality, Charles actually gifted George 47 large cents in March of 1921. And then he sold the other 149 that he had in his collection to George from the, between the years 1922 to 1924. I'm only talking here about the early dates, by the way, because that's the only research I've done. I don't, I didn't look at any middle dates, large sense, or any late date, large sense. So from 1816 to 1857, I have not done any looking there, but I've seen all the coins that are in his early date collection, Charles, George Claps. But Charles is the one we're talking about now. So Charles was responsible for uh, much of the coins that George obtained. But same with the colonials. The colonials don't get enough, uh, 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 let's say, he doesn't get enough credit. He offered his collection of Massachusetts silver to Garrett in 1934. Garrett turned him down with a little terse letter that he, he didn't want to have any more duplicates in his collection. And so the uh, winner of the collection was uh, Carl Wurzbach. Wurzbach was so thrilled that he put out a letter into the numismatist. And you see right here, the numismatist is November 1936. And the letter, if I might point out, I purchased some time ago, I purchased the grand collection of Massachusetts silver formed by Charles E. Clapp of Bedford Hills well-known connoisseur of colonial coins, which was the most complete, most complete of any collection that he had ever seen at that time. He obtained 63 different varieties with one die break edition, 63 different. Well, we all know Wurzbach gets a lot of attention about his Massachusetts silver. And here's, the, here, here's some of the, um, uh, the, the, the problem. Uh, I'll get into that in a moment. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the next slide. Keep the, Mass keep the Massachusetts silver in the back of your mind. His large scent collection. There's a list of all the large scents that are at the American Numismatic Society. 196 of them were owned by Charles Clapp. Clapp's, George Clapp's own notes show that 47 of those were gifted in March of 1921 and the rest George bought during the years 1922 to 1924. In George Clapp's own hand, uh, those notes. I might mention that all this information, it's not just because of my research, it's also because of friends helping and, and, and sending me things that, uh, I, I, I thought that they think would be of interest. For example, Wayne, who you just heard speak before, he sent me all his information on the early state, early uh, in Western Pennsylvania Numismatic Association. It was a wonderful read. And I got an interesting email from Dane Nielsen back in 2015. The book that Wayne showed earlier, The Sense of 1798 and 1799 that George Clapp wrote, he sent a copy of that to his brother Charles. And the inscription in that copy reads, to Charles E. Clapp, who really started me on my study of sense in 1921 with the thanks of the author, the date and, and initial George Clapp. This came from Dane Nielsen. All right, so now that we know that much of the collection that George assembled came from his brother, his younger brother, and also 
from um, Carl, uh, well, not George. George did not own the Massachusetts store. Charles did. Much of these credits get lost, and Charles, get, he just gets lost in the, in, in, the, uh, in the flurry. The John J. Ford sale had 28 specimens that were pedigreed back to Charles Clapp. However, in the opening two pages, in the introduction of the collection, it's all about Clapp, and it's all about Wurzbach, it's all about uh, T.J. Clark, it's all about Boyd and Ford, but that, there's never a mention about Charles Clapp. And I think that's sort of sad because this is the type of coins that he had. Look at this oak tree two pence. Look at the oak tree six pence. And look at the pine tree showing. Now, not every coin was of superb quality. Some of them were maybe in very good and fine condition, but they were, of course, rarities. But this is the type of collection that Charles, Charles had. As far as his large sense go, I'm only going to show you a few because we don't have the time for many, but Charles owned this Sheldon 11B, 1793, in superb condition. He owned the extremely rare Sheldon 272, which uh, gives way to like second or third finest known. And then look at the coin over on the right-hand side, Sheldon 26. That's not a rare coin. It's very common. It's one of the most common of all the 1794 varieties. Now, Clapp even admits that he did not collect him by die state, but his brother did, and then so did he once he obtained the collection. What's unusual about this is it was the only known specimen of Sheldon 26 that did not have a die crack on the reverse coming here over by the letter by the letters E and S, going through the E. The only specimen known until one was found about 10 years ago. Interesting, you know a lot about the collectors when you see what they collected. So you would think that they only collected finest coins. Well, look at the, the shape of the obverse. A lot of damage in the hair, some dents on the, on the rim. Charles Clapp, it was also known that he went bankrupt and he needed money. That's why he sold his collection of Massachusetts silver. Well, when he moved to Washington, D.C. in around 1905, he bought the Arlington. Didn't rent it, he bought it. In 1902, he bought the Rosemont. That was his wife's and his summer retreat for seven years. Didn't rent it, he bought it. He needed a place for horses. He wanted somewhere to go that he could relax in the cool air of, of Virginia. That was his summer retreat. Now I will say he did have financial trouble in 1907. He was uh, hurt by the uh, New York City banking scandal. And in 1909, he did sell this to a person who only kept it a short time, did a little fixing up and then sold it to the Harriman family. Uh, Averill Harriman, not Averill Harriman, he didn't not buy it, but he was one of the brothers. So this is now a resort that uh, I think many of you might know about. But this was, this was Charles Clapp's summer home. When he finally moved to New York City, he moved up to the northern end of Millionaire's Row, 1145th Avenue. That's on the, this building, was on, is on the corner of 95th Street and 5th Avenue. Now, I have no evidence that Charles Clapp owned it. He may have rented space in there, but seeing what he did with many other properties, my guess would be that he did own it, but I, I can't prove that, so let's not repeat too much of that. Now, here's the problem. You remember I mentioned before about Charles Jr. having the same name as his father? And he was born in 1899. So Charles Edwin Clapp, same middle name, Charles Edwin Clapp Jr., Charlie, born in 1899, same name as dad. He drops out of college, out of Yale University, because the fervor is to get into the war. World War I was going on. And any young male wanted to do his duty. He joined the army the pilot school in the army. He learns how to fly, but he also learns 
that how to drink. His family did not allow alcohol in their home. I believe it was his mother who had an alcoholic father. So his grandfather was an alcoholic and they were very strict about that. But being in the army, anytime anybody came home from service, uh, there was always a party. Now, Charlie, the, the younger, he never sees any action. He meets up with a young lady that he knew at Yale, Margaret McDonald, and they do decide to go back to school and they also decide to get married. But it's just not in Charlie's blood because during the summers in college, he was working on Wall Street and he admits this. He was making $5,000 a year. He was making all kinds of money. He did not need college to succeed. So despite his family's wishes, he quits school, marries his girl, making money on Wall Street, and he joins the prestigious firm of Thomas M. McKee. But all this time, he's drinking and drinking and drinking. He purchased a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, as you can see in the spring of 1929. Now that, that year should ring quite a bell for most of us because we know just a few months later, they were going to have the crash and he pays $492,000 for the seat. Warren Jr., he drinks, he cheats, he gets divorced, bankruptcy. It's not Charles Clapp Sr. that needed the money. It's not Charles Clapp Sr., the coin collector that went bankrupt. It's his son with the same name. So when you read there's a colonial coin book out there. You'll read in there that Charles E. Clapp sold his collection because he ran into financial trouble. No, his son ran into financial trouble. You'll also read about the Wurzbach that Charles Clapp sold it because he needed the money at the time. It's not well known, but a week after he offered his colonial silver to Garrett, his wife died from a long illness. I can only think it must have been cancer, but his wife had a long illness. He was also in his 70s when this happened. He was 74 years old. At 74, he wasn't needing the money. It was just his time. Also, his wife was dying. All right, some good news. Young Charles does eventually get sober, and his mentor was a a gentleman named Bill Wilson, who you know is an Alcoholics uh, Anonymous founder. And actually, Bill Wilson has said that Charles Clapp was the first person that they ever got sober. Now, how do we know much of this? Primary evidence. Charles Jr. writes several books on alcoholism. The most famous was The Big Bender, and that's what it looks like in paperback. I couldn't afford an original. They sell for, well, I could afford it, but I didn't want to spend six to $800 on an original, so I bought that. Charles Jr. admits all of this. It's a good read. And uh, I might mention that chapter 18, XVIII, is devoted to his bankruptcy. Moving on. Now that we've fixed Charles's reputation somewhat, Robert Book, born in Allegheny in 1862, so he was two years younger than, than Charles Clapp. He was four years younger than George Clapp. He married Maria Donnell, uh, and uh, the, uh, he, he did pass away up in Ontario, Ontario Canada. Um, his mom, I'm sorry, uh, David, let me start over. I, he born in 1862. His mom and dad were David and Maria. Uh, Maria's middle name, uh, middle, her, her maiden name rather, was Donnell, and that's where you get the Robert D. from. Uh, also interesting, he married Martha Miller. And uh, we know that Wilson Miller, her father, yeah, he was the one who started the Pittsburgh Locomotive Works, also the first national bank and the Bank of Pittsburgh. Robert was noted as a coin dealer as a teen. Uh, I got that from Wayne's information. Correspondence clerk at the first national bank of Pittsburgh. And he worked hard at the banks but he got the chance of his lifetime in 1902 to become a partner at Robinson Brothers in Pittsburgh, 
Those are private bankers. They own four seats on the Pittsburgh exchange and one on the New York exchange. That one on the New York exchange has nothing to do with Charles Claps. Uh, all three men were great philanthropists, but Robert and his wife, they really put their money where their mouth was. When the pandemic hit in 1918, the flu, Robert was right there volunteering and became the chairperson of the Pittsburgh chapter of the American Red Cross. They did many good things. When he died suddenly in 1929, up in Ontario, uh, his collection was sold by his widow to George Clapp. And I might say that in the records that I have, he does state that he gave uh, his widow $20,000 for, for the all the specimens. And I saw the individual records. And there was not a cheating cent given. He paid more than probably what they were worth at the time. By the way, this is in May of 1930 after the crash and George is paying uh, uh, Martha book $20,000. Of that group of coins, 97 specimens are in the ANS transfer. And we'll talk about that in a moment also, but I'd just like you to see some of the coins that were owned by Robert Book one of the finest known Sheldon 33s, known as the wheel spoke. And you can see the wheel spoke gets its name from six cracks, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Uh, I can't see it here because my picture is in the way. Let me see what I can do. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Six die breaks, known as the wheel spoke. He also owned a sparred reverse. And in the ANS collection, this is their finest. They have two, but uh, this was the finest. This was Robert Book's coin, second finest known starred reverse. 94 stars were on the dentilation. He also owned die states. I like to mention that. This is the terminal die state of Sheldon 46. It has the die cracks that it's known for also has the cud V above the four, and the reverse is always known to have this damage. This is not after mint damage, it's pre-mint damage. And he also had a stunning Sheldon 71 with clash marks that justify imagination. You can see here letters from America. Here's the M and the E. Look at the leaf marks and the stem from the wreath under Miss Liberty's chin. Uh, look at the, uh, also around the, uh, the uh, letters uh, O of, from of, and over here on the reverse, it doesn't, you don't see the clash marks as well on the reverse, but right here you will see clash marks under the R-I-C-A, and they do come from the obverse. Let's talk a little bit about George. George Clapp, born December of 1858, as Wayne showed you. Parents DeWitt Clinton Clapp and Delia Deming. He married Annie Wardrop Love. They had two daughters, no sons. After college, as Wayne also showed, he was a machinist at the Penn Cotton Mill. He became a chemist at the Black Diamond Steelworks. A partnership formed with Alfred E. Hunt also. And Alfred E. Hunt, um, uh, well known also in the, in the aluminum industry, merged into the Pittsburgh testing labs, later the Pittsburgh Reduction Company, and as Wayne mentioned, it became Alcoa. George was also a major philanthropist, but he was an intense numismatist, especially with the U.S. large sense. There's a picture of him in his old age, a little bit before he passed away. His donations were significant. He gave the American Numismatic Society the best of the best. His first line collection did go to them in 1946. He did sign a letter back in the 1930s of his intent. 
the Carnegie Museum received his second line collection in 1949, right after he had passed away. Now, a lot of people, they kind of make fun or, or poke fun at the Carnegie collection. They say it was second rate. I've seen the photographs. I don't think you could really call it second rate. It would be a significant collection for anyone. But it was George's intention that every variety that he had and any dye state that he had, despite the fact that he didn't care for dye states, but every variety and every dye state that was different from each other would go to the American Numismatic Society. Any duplicates of them would go to the Carnegie. That was his wishes. I also might answer a question that was posed to me just before uh, the seminar. And the question was from a friend of mine, why didn't he offer it for sale? It was worth a lot of money. Well, he obviously didn't need the money, but it was specifically George's wishes that the collections remain intact for future study by numismatists in the coming years. He really thought that out. By the way, here's the book that Wayne showed earlier on the United States Census of the Year 1798-1799 by George Clapp. Dean Nielsen sent over a photo of the inscribed uh, page that shows to Charles Clapp, who really started me on my study of the sense in 1921 with the thanks of the author. And there you have it. Two other books that he prepared, you could also see, uh, you saw that on Wayne's, the uh, sense of 1795, 6, 7, and 1800. The reason why other years were missing is because other books were written by other people. For example, Howard Newcomb did 1801-23. Also over here, oh, by the way, this was a joint effort with Howard Newcomb, as Wayne pointed out. There was also a pamphlet put out by, the, uh, by Wade Raymond, and this was on the sense of 1804 to 1814 but it wasn't uh, the extensive and in, in-depth in work that he did on the uh, other two. One last thing that I'll show, there's a letter up at the uh, American Numismatic Society from Clapp to Homer Downing. And just so we make sure we see this, Clapp tells Downing, in March 1921, I bought these coins for my brother. And down below, I neglected to say in the above that in 1930, purchased a collection of Robert Book from his uh, widow, of course, and it had quite a nice lot in there of 1796. Well, one final, the T.J. Clark boxes. How do we know all this information? How do we get it? Charles Clapp, how do we know all the information about Robert Book? Well, like I said, George was meticulous and he was intense. The T.J. Clark boxes that he used, on the back of the box, the box would state what the year of the coin was, the Hayes attribution, the Chapman attribution, the descriptions, no fraction bar. This is a Sheldon 64, note for the no fraction bar at between the one and the 100. He would do a description, and then the ANS wrote down its notation that this was a gift in 1946, and the 143.176 is a designation of whose it was, the 143 being the collapse donation, and this was the 176th coin in the collection. Also, the purchase information came from the Jenkins sale. There's the lot number who purchased it after from the Jenkins sale, his brother Charles, and in 12 of 24, it wasn't bought by me, the purchase information, the word mendacious, M-E-N-D-A-C-I-O-U-S, mendacious was CLAP's code. The M and the E indicated what was paid for it. M was the first letter in capitals, so it was $1. E was in capitals. M-E, E is the second letter in Mendacious, that's the second letter. He paid $12 for this coin to get it from his brother in December of 1924. If these were in lower letters, they would mean cents. With that, 
Wayne and I are ready to answer any questions. Nice. Well, thank you very much, Wayne and Chuck. Um, so, folks, um, before we get into questions, I am now going to be launching a survey. Uh, please, please make sure uh, before you leave the room, uh, complete this survey. Uh, it is multiple choice. I hope you choose to take it. Um, if you need to elaborate on one of your answers or have additional comments, please email them to Brianna Victor at seminars at money.org. Again, if you need to elaborate on one of the answers, uh, email them to seminars at money.org. So, um, of course, a couple people uh, sent in uh, well wishes uh, to the birthday boy. Uh, happy birthday, of course, Wayne. Thank um, you, everybody. So one person asked, um, uh, were these guys related to the clap uh, whose coins went to Eliasburg? Uh, no so were these guys related to the clap uh, who, whose coins went uh, to uh, the Eliasburg collection or uh, to Eliasburg? The gold, the uh, gold collection, uh, no relation. They're not, they're not even, they're not related in any way. And and there was a clap though. That was a James clap or a, a, a John clap. I'm not I'm not sure of the first name, but the gold collection that was in Eliasburg, uh, no relation to the brothers. Okay. Right. Oh, Chuck, I just realized you're uh, still sharing the screen. Uh, you could uh, escape. Oh, here. I'm sorry. I apologize. No, no, that's okay. I was just realizing you yeah, had still set up there, but uh, that is fine. Okay, so. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah. One person who sent you well wishes, Wayne, is a gentleman by the name of uh, Jeff D. Jeff Danaher, uh, for now of Cincinnati, Ohio, but he said he was a former uh, WPNS member in the mid 80s before he went away to college. So, one of the birthday uh, wishes that came through for you. Um, so, let's see. There's. Um, Oh, we may have just answered this. Uh, Chuck. It says, uh, was John H. Clapp related to the George H. Clapp family? And was John involved with the WPNS? Well, I, I know he wasn't part of the goal. I mean, he, he, that his gold collection, no. He was, like I said, he was not uh, related to the brothers. But as far as Western Pennsylvania, Wayne would have to take that one. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not familiar with a John Clapp. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, one person uh, asked, uh, they said, I am a member of the Carnegie Museum. Is the CLAP collection available for my viewing? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part? Is it available for viewing, did you say? Yes, yeah, I think this gentleman wanted to know if, uh, because he's a member of the Carnegie Museum, he wants to know if the CLAP collection's uh, available uh, to view. Uh, it's available for members. Okay, unfortunately, the collection is not on display. Uh, it is very well cared for. Um, it uh, has been on display at various times. Um, in I think it was in 1989 at the first a a convention, they did uh, uh, bring it out for a uh, display at the museum. Uh, I was on the committee in 18, excuse me, in, in 1989 as well as in 2004, and we really, really wanted to get them to bring it to the convention center to display it for the uh, attendees. But uh, you know their policies and insurance, they would not let it leave the building. So they have the collection. Uh, it is on display on rare occasions with many years or decades in between. Uh, <laughs> now, going forward, uh, this is something that the local club will have to, uh, to, to deal with. Uh, while I was still a member and still living in Pittsburgh, the uh, club uh, had a uh, kind of a uh, uh, meeting of the minds with the, the people at the, uh, at the museum. There was a, a long period after the sale of the collection when there was a lot of bad blood. But after a number of years went by, the club had reached out to the uh, curators at, at the Carnegie. And for a period of time, uh, and it was multiple years, once a year, they would allow us to have, us meaning WPNS, to have a meeting at the museum. 
And while we had that meeting at the museum, they would bring out some of the clap coins uh, that we could actually uh, see in person. So that has been an option in the past, may not be an option today or in the future. You know, it all depends on, uh, you know, the current policies of the museum and the curators. It's worth uh, inquiring about. Okay. I, I'd like to mention also, one of the disappointments of this virus was the cancellation, not just of the ANA convention, but the EAC convention, which was supposed to be held in early May in Pittsburgh. And the uh, museum was going to bring out the collection of the large sense for us to view. Uh, it was arranged by uh, Chris Pretch and Tom Nist, members of the uh, Early American Coppers Club, and Deborah Harding, who is the uh, curator up there. And uh, I guess if you wanted to see the collection, uh, like I say, Wayne knows much more about it than I do, but Deborah Harding was, and I've spoken to her, dealt with her. She's a lovely lady. Uh, it'd be nice to have met her. I hope we all live long enough to get back to Pittsburgh and maybe do it, a, try and do it another time. Yeah, I'll second that motion. Deb Harding is, is great to work with and she would be a good contact. And uh, yeah. if the club doesn't have that contact, I can help you. One thing, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Eckberg shared and said that the Clap Carnegie coins can be seen on the NNP, uh, thanks to the NNP and uh, EAC. So uh, check out the uh, Newman Numismatic Portal, and uh, apparently uh, you can see them there. So thanks for uh, sharing that info, Bill. Appreciate that. Can I mention uh, something about that also? I'm sorry? Can I mention something also? Uh, Wayne, weren't those photographs taken by uh, Lyle Engelson? Uh, I'll let Bill take that answer. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I, I, I believe they were. So the photographs that you guys have at the Newman, Newman Numismatic Portal are absolutely breathtaking. Yeah, the EAC and Bill Eckberg helped arrange the uh, photographer. Um, yeah. So maybe in chat he could uh, tell us who that was. Yeah, they, they're okay. fabulous. Uh, I said uh, Lyle did pick them. Okay, great. So there's that. Okay, let's get some uh, other questions that we had in here. Let's see. Um, one person says, uh, thank you, both uh, Wayne and Chuck, for a fantastic and educational seminar. Chuck, would you please consider presenting this seminar to a future Sun City Coin Club meeting? <laughs> I've got some friends that are watching. I want you to blank these guys. Got it. You know what? I will just say yeah, I, Of course I would. Of course I would. So someone else asked, um, where did Charles get most of his large cents from? And could one still find large cents in circulation as the claps were growing up? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Uh, well, no. In, in circulation, large cents? No. The answer to that would probably be no. I can't speak for sure. But while they were growing up, in the 18, let's say 70s, because now they're about 10 years old, they might have been collecting coins and they might have found some, like, like, like Wayne mentioned about going down to the toll collector at the bridge. I'm sure they could have found a few, but we understand that pretty much, the large sense pretty much disappeared from circulation as soon as the uh, small cents were made in 1857. However, Charles Clapp, had several ads in the numismatists that he wanted to buy large cents. Even after he sold his collection to George, he was still buying large cents. That was in 1924, five, six, I can't remember exactly when, but I, I've seen the ads and uh, many of the coins were bought at auction also. Uh, you'll see the notes on the boxes uh, where these were obtained. There's also the name Ellsworth, now, I don't want you to think that they bought them from Steve Ellsworth, but there was a coin dealer back in the turn of the century named Ellsworth. His first name escapes me now. I'm sure Wayne will know it. But um, anyway, a lot of coins were bought from the Ellsworth collection. Huh. Helps. One uh, other person asks, uh, are you planning another trip to the museum when the ANA comes back to Pittsburgh? 
Personally, I am. Okay. <laughs> I, I owe Deborah Harding a lunch or a dinner. Gotcha. All right. Um, oh, thanks, Bill. Yeah, Bill Eckberg shared the uh, link to the uh, Carnegie coins on the NNP. I will see if I can uh, post that in the chat. I'm not sure if I can get that from the uh, Q&A section here, but I'll give that a shot. Um, do you have another question here? It says, are the Clap books based just on his collection? Uh, I have the Elder Hayes Frossard on 1794, Chapman on 1794, Gilbert on 1796. Do they all supplement each other? Which others are essential on the early sets? You want to take that, Wayne? I was going to send it over to you. <laughs> That's a good okay, question. I, I mean, I, yeah, I can you got do it. it. I don't want to. Yeah, yeah you, I, I've not been a student uh, in that level of detail of the sense, so uh, uh, I'll defer on that one. Well, well, the gentleman that's asking that question, he's got the books that are necessary. That, that's why George never wrote a book on the 1794s, because he has the Frossard Hayes. He has the Chapman. So that's already been done. What, what George... George didn't work on every year. The archives up at the American Numismatic Society are voluminous. Every, every letter, every uh, note is separated by year. And George kept copies of every letter that he wrote to anybody. And it always dealt with, with of course, large sense. He, co he corresponded with, uh, with Ebenezer Gilbert. He corresponded with Robert Book. He corresponded with, uh, uh, with uh, Howard Newcomb. Uh, he corresponded with, uh, with Homer Downing. There's so much work that he did. So what he tried to do was fill in the gaps. He felt there wasn't a good book on 1795. A book on 96 had already been done by Gilbert. And uh, uh, 97 hadn't been done, 98 hadn't been done, 99 hadn't been done. So that, that's why Charles Clapp did those books. So the person that has all those separate individual books, that was what you needed, of course, when you were growing up in the 1920s and 30s. Until, of course, uh, William Sheldon came along. And William Sheldon freely admits in his beginning pages, uh, he worked off the backs of so many other people. He just put everything together in one book. Yeah, Penny Whimsy, good one. So, right, Penny um, let's see, someone else asked, uh, what about the fabulous Tone Silver in the Eliasberg collection? Related? The silver? I can't speak to that. Okay. I'm sure. Yeah, I figured uh, it's uh, mostly an EAC talk here, so. Anyway, um, uh, Len asks, uh, how many of the clap scents remain unrecovered in the ANS collection? I, I don't know that. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, 129. Del Bland, Del Bland found in uh, 1989, 1990 that 129 coins had been taken from the clap collection up in New York City at the ANS. How many have been recovered? Uh, I don't have a tally, but some are still missing. And uh, I wouldn't even give an estimate on how many have been recovered. Well, by the way, we should also say that of the 129 pieces that were taken, they were replaced with sometimes inferior coins sometimes equal coins uh, and, and what occasionally even I think might maybe might have been a better coin uh, but uh, that the better coins would kind of be far and few between but uh, they were replaced by mostly uh, lesser coins all right well gentlemen uh, I think that may be the last of the questions I saw come through here so uh Again, I definitely want to thank you guys one more time, both Wayne and Chuck. Um, we uh, have a certificate of appreciation I'll be sending to uh, 
both you guys, uh, you'll have to tear it in half so you can share it. Um, <laughs> make sure to give each you guys one, of course. Uh, folks, um, this is our penultimate uh, Money Talks presentation uh, for this year um, for the uh, canceled uh, World's Fair of Money Talks. Um, please join us for the last of our 2020 Money Talks lectures, Symbols of the Sun God on Coins of the Eccentric Emperor Elagabalus by Michael Cotis on uh, Wednesday the 26th at noon um, or 2 p uh, noon Mountain Time or 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, if you'd like to register for this presentation and see the other upcoming ones as well as the ones we have archived, please visit the ANA website money.org. There's a big slider going across the middle of the screen where it talks about the ANA eLearning Academy. Click on that for more info. Folks, thanks again for joining us. Appreciate you uh, spending your time learning uh, some really cool EAC stuff today. Um, we'll see you next time at the ANA Z Learning Academy. Thanks again to our presenters, Chuck Hack, Wayne Homerin. Really appreciate your time today, gentlemen. Uh, folks, uh, if you haven't voted, I think we've got everyone who has uh, pretty much gone in there, so we can uh, pretty much end this. Um, thanks again. Uh, we had about 48 people in the room today, guys. Just thought I'd let you know. All thank right. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. See you next time.